I uh, founded uh, a group called Arab International Development. We're a group within a large independent firm called Arup, which uh, is global, um, and it specializes in the built environment. Um, my history includes uh, post-disaster work since 1991. And in uh, following the tsunami, I spent a year working for UNHCR in Sri Lanka. And when I came back to this country, I decided that there was a gap, there was a need for the expertise in the built environment to be available um, and accessible uh, to humanitarian and development agencies. Um, because some of the things that I was seeing um, out in Sri Lanka, and then I spent the next two years uh, going back and forth from Aceh, um, made me realize that we're moving into a very new space in terms of post-disaster uh, responses, um, and it's a space that is going to become increasingly um, urban. Um, and that's, so that's really some background to just where I'm coming from um, in terms of this discussion. Um, we also worked in Haiti. I'm afraid I have no experience at all of Myanmar, so I was fascinated to, to hear that, read that part of your report. Um, and thank you for an excellent uh, report. I mean, it's always really interesting reading someone else's perspective, particularly when it's well-informed and researched on situations that um, you've been involved in. Um, is there a control? Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> um, I press that one? Um, yeah, that's it. Um, there are three themes that I just wanted to sort of add, really, to the discussion today. Uh, the first being purpose and principles. People who know me know that I'm very purposeful. Um, I always ask why. It's my favourite question. Um, and, you know, understanding the purpose of something, you know, helps unite people. Um, but it goes alongside principles. And, you know, there are, and so I put these two things together. Um, secondly, build safer and better. Uh, the term build back better by engineers is translated as safer, particularly if you're in a post-disaster situation that's been caused by a natural hazard. Um, so separating out the build safer and better, and I've shamelessly taken that from uh, one of the speakers uh, at the very good looking back at reconstruction cinema seminar that uh, BHSF organized last year, which Theo is here so he can tell you more. Um, and the last is really creating resilient communities, which is where most of my work centres now, um, which links back to the purpose. What are we trying to build back better? Mm. Are we trying to build back better the infrastructure or are we trying to build back better the communities and societies um, that have suffered from disasters mm. so that they can survive but also thrive and be better equipped to deal with the next situation that may be thrown at them, which may be very different. Um, Aha. Uh -huh. um, disasters um, create a significant amount of disruption, but I think we have to always remind ourselves that they are overlaid on a wider context of development. Um, and this diagram tries to illustrate this. The red triangle is the disaster. Um, and Disasters create immediate needs and immediate vulnerabilities that need to be catered for. And the bits of that red triangle, which are outside um, of the blue triangles, are really illustrating that emergency relief phase. And when I first got involved in disaster work at the beginning of the 90s, everyone was very clear that humanitarian efforts were focused on emergency relief. And it was about preventing further loss of life after a disaster and provision of food and water and medical care, um, shelter also. But over the 20 years or so that I've been involved in this world, there's been a migration from relief to reconstruction. So 20 years ago, there was one crowd of people who did relief and one crowd of people who did development. And they were very different people and there was a lot of concern about the disconnect between them. Over the years, I think there's been a very positive transition recognizing from relief to recovery. But the consequence of the enormous amount of funding that was around after the tsunami created this shift from recovery through to reconstruction. And I really believe it dates back to then because mm. there were the, the book that was being written by the Shelter Centre at the time suddenly got reconstruction in its title. Humanitarian agencies that had never, ever engaged in reconstruction waded in the deep end. I've got 25 years of reconstruction experience and the sympathy I felt 
for some of the young engineers and architects who humanitarian agencies had employed to deliver programs in Aceh was limitless. Mm -hmm. They were heroes. And what was put on their shoulders, you would not put on the shoulders of 25-year-old um, 20 engineers with 25 years experience. Um, so I think there has been this mission creep or mandate creep, um, which I think, and the Build Back Better also arrived at that time. Mm. And I wince at the phrase reconstruction because I'm an engineer. And so it immediately means to me buildings and bridges. Yeah. But actually it's not, it's about rebuilding communities. But you don't reconstruct communities. Yeah. So that in itself is a, is a complete um, misnomer. The interesting thing is very little is written relatively um, about the aftermath of the tsunami in Sri Lanka or indeed India and Thailand, compared to Aceh. Yeah. Um, I was in Sri Lanka for the first 12 months after the tsunami, and the interesting thing there is that the government set up two agencies on almost day one, Tafur and Tafren. Yeah. And one was focused on the emergency yeah. and re um, relief and recovery effort, including the transitional shelter program, which I was coordinating, and the other was focusing on reconstruction. Now, it meant that the reconstruction effort, th or the thinking towards the reconstruction effort, did start on day one, but it was a different group of actors. You contrast that to Aceh, where BRR took many, many, many months to get established, and then once it was established, to get up to speed. And it was very much focusing on the reconstruction effort. Um, I was very interested to read in the report and hear um, Lillian say that you know, peace was on the agenda from day one. The first time I went to Aceh was 15 months after the tsunami. And I was abs I'd done my homework to understand a little bit about Aceh as a country, as a context, and I was absolutely stunned that as I went around, I was doing the, the assurance mission for the Disaster Emergencies Committee, as I went around talking to agencies, the majority of people working for those agencies um, had no appreciation that Aceh had suffered from 30 years of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, they tended to have no appreciation that earthquakes cause tsunamis, mm -hmm. and that therefore, if you are going to build back better, earthquake resistance is fairly fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, and I gave two presentations to two forums mm -hmm. that were chaired by UN Habitat. One was in English for all the international expat workers, mm -hmm. and the other was in the local Indonesian language for all the Indonesian agencies. So they were clearly not talking to each other, and in fact the system was keeping them apart, um, to actually really advocate very strongly that Banda Aceh sits on one of the most significant fault lines in the world, mm -hmm. comparable to San Francisco, and that to actually not put safe construction at the center of the reconstruction effort was going to you know, end up long term just building in vulnerability and wasting funds. Mm. Um, the Aceh response also highlighted very, very strongly the uh, limitation of the humanitarian architecture and the cluster system. Uh, Kunturu, who led the uh, BRR, um, is wonderfully vocal about this when he talks on international platforms. Um, and, he's, and, he, and he talks about it with such humour, because he was just simply, from a human perspective, completely astonished that the humanitarian community had broken themselves down into these sectorial silos rather than thinking in an integrated way about the needs of a community, mm. whatever those needs might be. But one of the things, that, um, some work we did last year um, for the um, International Federation, and it wasn't, it was the Danish Red Cross, um, on integrated programming, highlighted that one of the major challenges is that, is that the fact the agencies have all structured themselves in silos, in, in sectors. And actually, one of the challenges to achieving a integrated programming is actually having organizations with individuals who can create a coordinated response. Um, and, and that's the same type of problem we're having in our organization, um, trying to turn people from or, or get specialists to actually work with generalists and think in a more integrated, uh, systematic way. I think the other challenge that, that came up in Aceh was um, that the humanitarian architecture changed in what I refer to as the laws of the jungle. Um, the laws of the jungle mean there are tigers who eat deer and you know, so on down the food chain. Um, and there's a sort of, there historically has been a food chain. 
um, in humanitarian response. Uh, and donors and NGOs, the Red Cross, have all played their respective parts. Um, but I noticed when I was reading uh, Lillian's report that the word donors comes up. But who are the donors? Because certainly in Aceh, it was a real mix mm -hmm. of the World Bank, UN agencies with very substantial funds, international NGOs with very, very substantial funds, more than perhaps they'd ever had mm -hmm. at their direct disposal mm -hmm. um, ever before. And I think all of these things has actually changed um, the, the way everyone was approaching uh, the relief and recovery effort. And then Bill Clinton came along with a wonderful strap line, Build Back Better. And everyone can fall in behind that because it's wonderfully accessible. The organization I work for has a strap line, We Shape a Better World. But I, it's not specific. It's no more specific than Build Back Better. There's no why or what or how. So I wonder if we're, you know, if we're just attracted to jargon. You know, what do we mean by reconstruction? What do we mean by Build Back Better? I'm just going to jump to the next one. Oh, that wasn't meant to be in here. That's interesting. Um, I made this uh, jigsaw of construction technologies from various photographs that I'd taken in Aceh, um, really to illustrate the point about safer and safer and better. There was a wide, wide variety of construction technologies used in Aceh. Every single one of them resulted in a house of roughly the same size, which provided a roof over the head of the people who had been previously living in tents. So in terms of relief, it succeeded. In terms of recovery or reconstruction or building back better, one has to look much more broadly. Was it right to, try and e to even try and improve on existing construction practices which involved coal charcoal-fired bricks? Masonry construction like that is prohibited by almost every code of practice in countries where there are earthquakes. And the bricks themselves um, have got a very high environmental footprint. Yet a vast majority of houses were built using this construction methodology. Others did try and introduce safer practices like reinforced masonry, which is, is accepted but faced really, really big challenges culturally because it was done on a sort of program by program basis. And then others brought in completely alien technologies. You can see in the bottom uh, right hand corner, which was pre-cast constructions, Lego bolted together. You know, they achieved speed. They satisfied the greed of the housing companies who were marketing those products in Aceh. But they achieved little else in terms of recovery, or and certainly nothing in terms of, of better for the families long term. You can't even build on an extension by, by knocking a hole through the wall. And then there were others who actually tried to pr promote vernacular construction uh, made out of timber, which required unearthing people like this gentleman in the bottom right hand corner, who actually still possess the skills to build in that form of construction. One of the very interesting things about the conference I went to last week, which involved speakers from all around the world talking about how you build back better, and building technologies were discussed, as was the importance of high community engagement. But the lasting, the, the, the key thing that they all said was how very, very difficult it is to leave a lasting legacy in terms of post-disaster reconstruction. And they were talking from a perspective mostly of developmental programs, their thinking had been very de de developmental. But when you're in a post-disaster situation and you want to get people um, in houses quickly, there's a, co there's a conflict between the, the lead-in time needed to introduce different building practices. And if it's going to succeed, it, it needs investment in the market to create companies that will produce the products. It needs investment in training and it needs investment in institutions. And that requires a much more strategic and integrated response than um, NGOs, an individual NGO or a UN agency uh, can provide. 
Priscilla will talk about Haiti, so I've jumped over that. Um, <laughs> just to go to my final point, um, which is that I think Build Back Better doesn't help me because there is no real purpose in it. Um, the better is relative. I've got to do a lot of work to find out what happened before. I've got to look, look, look backwards. How are people living before? What is better? What does better mean to them? And it's all, there's a lot of room for negotiation. Um, I'm someone who likes looking ahead more than I like looking in the rear view, view, mirror, rear view mirror. And I think that there needs to be vision about what we're trying to achieve when we engage in any post-disaster uh, response or indeed development. Uh, most of the work that I'm doing now is very much focused on resilience, which is a word that is misused all too frequently. Um, but resilience is about the ability of communities to survive and thrive. And this diagram is from work that we did for the International Federation of the Red Cross, which interviewed communities in 58 different communities in Southeast Asia and then in Latin America to talk to them about what made them resilient. And I think the interesting thing looking at this um, in the context of this discussion is that the quality of infrastructure and services is there. It is one of the important things. But so is the need for economic, economic opportunities and livelihoods, as is environmental management, which is not, not looked at um, strategically so often. And then the way you do things, participation and ownership, is what will inevitably lead to more coherent and organised communities. So I look at this and think, if I was going to be designing a housing programme now in the Philippines, might I design a housing programme that is actually trying to have objectives that the overriding goal is to create a more resilient community and the objective is to provide good quality infrastructure and services, but also to try and do as much as possible to relate to these other um, factors of resilience. This slide, which is illegible for you probably, um, but it's, <laughs> it's to remind me to talk to it, is very much echoed at the work we're currently doing to look at what city res resilience means at a city scale. And what this has highlighted is we've come up with eight characteristics that relate to a resilient city. And what's interesting is that meeting basic needs, disaster risk reduction, urban planning and environmental management are already there. But what these graphs, which relate to six different cities who have experienced disasters and ongoing stresses, um, identify is that investment is also needed to reinforce identity and promote relationships and community. Investment is needed in education and information and innovation to create an environment where people have the ability to learn and the ability to act. It's an enabling environment. Um, and finally, the other one is the interesting one is about um, the need to have a proper justice system. Um, and I was working in Rwanda in 1994 and those of you who, who remember that emergency will remember that the, the most significant intervention probably to rebuilding Rwanda as a country was actually around justice and, and the legal system um, to, to deal with the aftermath of the genocide. Um, so I would argue that we need to move beyond build back better because it doesn't help as a term. I'm not sure who would explain that to President Clinton. <laughs> and really put resilience um, out there as the goal of post-disaster um, recovery. <laughs>